So I'm going to be presenting data on uh, uh, pharmacokinetics and phenomenology of inhaled salvinornay in humans. First, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors on this work, and let me know if anyone can't hear me. But uh, um, first, Catherine McLean, uh, who was uh, the moderator for the interdisciplinary uh, track yesterday, who's done a lot of the heavy lifting um, in this project, so I want to give a special thanks to her. Um, uh, Chad Reisig, who's now working uh, at the FDA, a um, couple of folks from Tom Prisanzano's lab, Mike Caspers and Tom Prisanzano, they are responsible for the um, uh, production of salvinorin A as well as the pharmacokinetic analyses of plasma. And finally, Roland Griffiths. Uh, uh, Roland and I uh, begun work on this, I think, back in 2007, and it literally took a year and a half to get FDA approval to administer salvinorin A to humans, even though one mile up the road there were two head shops that would sell you it <laughs> without even checking an ID. Uh, but, uh, and it was Roland's uh, night of funding that uh, funded this work. So, just some background. Salvinorin A is the primary psychoactive constituent of the salvia divinorum plant. Traditional use um, as a sacrament, uh, it's been traditionally used as a sacrament among Mazatec indigenous people of Oaxaca, Mexico. It's really interesting uh, for a novel substance, it's a potent and selective kappa opioid agonist, um, really unlike um, any existing um, psychoact psychoactive drug that we uh, commonly know of, and the structure is very different than other existing kappa opioid agonists. Smoking and vapori or vaporizing is the most frequent um, administration route for non-indigenous -indig use of, uh, of salvinorin A in the form of salvia divinorum. In 2010, uh, the monitoring the future survey showed 5.5% of 12th graders reported past year use. So this is really um, you know, on par with cocaine and other drugs, you know, and that's not the level of cannabis, but this is a, you know, a very prevalent uh, substance that's being used by folks, and uh, a lot of times, well, the survey data suggests a lot of folks will only use it once or a few times, um, although that's not always the case, uh, but uh, I, I kind of think of it, it's sort of become the psychopharmacological version of bungee jumping. It's almost like a rite of passage. A lot of, especially young folks, um, college students will, you know, it's something they want to try curious, and once they try it, typically they don't have much curiosity in using it again. <laughs> it's a very intense drug, as we'll see. So the kappa opioid system uh, may be important for understanding and treating several disease states. Um, one example is cocaine dependence. Uh, animals, rats that receive salvinorin A um, in the laboratory will stop responding for cocaine. And the same thing is true of other uh, kappa agonists. So that's really interesting from a drug abuse and addiction perspective. Um, furthermore, uh, folks have suggested the kappa opioid system is really important for understanding uh, dementias such as Alzheimer's. And so when you get a novel, a, a, a drug that has a completely novel structure, that's really exciting because almost all drug development are tweaks of existing structures. And so this is a platform for not only, it, so not only may salvinorin A hold promise for different reasons, but analogs of salvinorin A which are being produced may have um, potential therapeutic applications. So I'll show you some pictures of uh, uh, the indigenous use of, of salvia divinorum, uh, these, uh, many of these are provided by Kathleen Harrison, um, who's at the meeting, an ethnobotanist uh, who's uh, lived with the Mazatec folks. And this is a leaf here. Um, this is the top of a plant. It's a beautiful plant. Uh, here's a flowering top. A lot of the news reports have suggested that it's, uh, you know, you can find it at your local garden shop. You know, cousins also in the family in the, in the same genus can be found at your but at your you know, local Home Depot or garden shop, but uh, you're not going to get any salvia divinorum there. So, but it's similarly uh, similar looking cousins. Another picture: the plant, uh, flowering tops, are very beautiful. A healer working with it. 
another Mazatec healer with uh, um, uh, freshly picked leaves uh, preparing for a, a ceremony. And so that was the traditional um, you know, picture of Salvi Divinorum and its use. So this is the contemporary non-indigenous you know, picture of Salvi Divinorum. It's, it shows up in these little packages, tinctures, and they, you know, they started out as uh, the straight um, unextracted sal um, salvia leaves, and you know, soon folks started manufacturing so-called um, uh, extracts that are labeled with uh, descriptors such as 5x, meaning five times the normal strength, or 10x, and it's just become a, some data shows that there's, you, know, you can't trust those claims at all. Of course, it's completely unregulated, but now I think it's, some of them say well, 60x and 100x, and you could say a billion x if you want to and sell it. But all sorts of little packages, sometimes flavors, as you see there. And, and Miley Cyrus became the real modern view of, of uh, Salvia Divo Norma a few years ago. Um, yeah, she was caught on take, uh, tape taking a, a, a big old bong hit of something, and there was all this buzz about what in the world is that? And she says it's this thing called salvia, and people say, oh, it's got to be cannabis. She's just making this thing up. What is salvia? But I'd have to really thank Miley because she, uh, yeah, she, she took her bong hit, uh, I think about a week after we published the first um, trial in the literature showing... <laughs> showing psychoactive doses of Salvinor A. So we had all kinds of publicity from the New York Times, front page of the Baltimore Sun, CNN ended up coming out to the lab. So I really need to add Miley to my acknowledgements page. <laughs> I don't know if she had me in mind, but if you want any attention around the drug you're studying, you know, if you can get a celebrity to kind of get caught uh, doing something, that might be a good strategy. So just to tell you briefly about our the study design, um, this was an ascending dose run-up study, and what that means is this is a, a first in humans trial, so there's a lot of unknowns about um, you know, what doses you want to give. So we started extremely trivial doses and worked our way up very cautiously. We didn't tell the participants that the doses were going in an ascending fashion because um, we wanted to do our best to control for you know, expectancy effects. We didn't want them to know that the doses were going to get uh, be stronger. Um, across sessions. But uh, eight participants um, uh, participated in our study, um, and all of them had used uh, previous uh, salvia divinorum previously, and also they had all used classic hallucinogens. First, we wanted to kind of take a look at folks that had just used classic hallucinogens like LSD and psilocybin to kind of get a blank slate on their opinion of salvia divinorum, but the FDA um, wouldn't let us do that, so everyone had salvia experience. Like in our psilocybin work, participants were screened with structured interviews to exclude those with serious um, psychiatric disorders or predisposition. Uh, the average age was 26 or 27 years old, range 21 to 35 years. There are three uh, women, five men in this sample. The mean age was, I uh, already told you that, and they had on average 10 uh, previous uses of salutative and norm, range from one to 40 times. There were 21, let me get rid of that little box there for you. Ah, didn't mean to do that. There we go. There were 21 sessions, all on separate days, um, where we administered vaporized salvinorin A or placebo. And we were very, although some of the sessions uh, uh, took place on concurrent uh, weekdays, we were very careful not to encourage people to have their next session if they felt that they weren't psychologically ready um, for the next session if they had a, a, a strong effect. There were several hours of contact time with staff before the first session because our assumption was that building trust and rapport was going to be important in ensuring safe psychological experience as much as with classic hallucinogens. Volunteers were told that either salvinorin A or placebo would be administered on any given session. There were 16 ascending doses of salvinorin A and I left these doses in terms of um, milligrams rather than converting to micrograms, just to show you the crazy potency of this drug. So we started out at 0 0.000375 milligrams. So uh, very, very strong drug. And it didn't take but a couple of steps into the ascending dose run-up before we started to see psychoactivity. We'll see that. Um, there were four placebo sessions intermixed throughout the um, active doses. 
and, and that simply consisted of inhaling warm air, as you'll see when I show you our setup. We assessed for subject rate of tolerability before administering any higher dose. Um, so if anyone said, whoa, hold, you know, <laughs> hold on, I don't want any more of that, um, uh, we, uh, yeah, we didn't administer that dose or any higher dose. And the final session was a repeat of the maximally tolerated dose for the purpose of collecting uh, plasma samples, so blood samples, for pharmacokinetic analysis, um, uh, and also for examining hormone levels, although we're not, I'm not going to show you data on the hormone levels uh, today. So this is a picture, if you've ever wondered what an FDA-approved uh, crack or methamphetamine pipe looks like, this is what it, that's basically what it is, you know, like a, very much like a so-called piezo. The, uh, this is a five uh, milliliter round bottom flask into which the salvinorinane was inserted. And we had to use uh, acetone to act volumetrically, um, a solution in acetone to volumetrically get it in. Uh, measure out the dose because it's so potent. You just can't measure that on even very good analytic scales. Um, and, and especially the lower doses, we're talking about such a little amount that this, there's barely, sometimes barely visible amount of white residue at the bottom, almost as if, if you leave a glass of water out for a few weeks and it totally evaporates and you have a little mineral content at the bottom. And we lit that with a, a, a microtorch from underneath. The the person administering the drug, which was either myself or Catherine for the, the different participants in the study, um, that person was sitting on this side of a room divider, which separated the administering person from the participant. Um, that way we can maintain a, a, a double blind, because the person, the other staff member who would have been over here, um, on the other side of the chair was the primary person to interact with the volunteer to collect um, subject-rated drug strength and, and to interact with them, provide support if there is any trouble. And I should say, in case you don't see, there's a, the pipe is over here and there's a, there's a tube, a vinyl tube that just, a hole through that room divider. So there's just, you know, they're just, they have this tube that's coming out of this wall. Um, volunteers inhaled deeply for 40 seconds while the pipe was lit, followed by um, exhalation. I went through this, that too. So our, our collection of time course um, data lasted for 60 minutes after drug administration. So every two minutes, um, we asked the person for um, subject-rated drug strength, so how strong the drug was on a 10-point, actually an 11-point scale. I'll show you that briefly. We also collected pulse and blood pressure every two minutes. Eye shades were worn for at least ten, the first 10 minutes after administration. That's because you know, many anecdotal reports of folks that have um, you know, claimed beneficial or insightful effects have said, this is the way you should use it. So we figured, let's start um, with that way. So much like uh, our work and others work with um, psilocybin. And then after the session, they were invited to um, write an open-ended narrative about the session. Also, I'll show you some of those, those quotes. Hopefully that'll be interesting. We all, um, in terms of results, uh, for tolerability, two male participants answered the yes tolerability question. That is, um, would you refuse to um, receive the same or higher dose of whatever you got today in future sessions? So if anyone out there thinks that the guys are the real psychonauts, you know, I think they just, maybe they just talk more about it, because in this study it was the ladies that went, ran the gauntlet, um, not the men. So the two males uh, answered the question at the end of the 19.5, which is the second highest dose that we provided, um, and did not receive the highest dose of 21 micrograms per kilogram. The dose that per kilogram means it was body weight adjusted. And that was just a pure assumption. We don't know, in fact, whether um, uh, effects are dependent on body weight. But we erred on that side. So here, here's just time course for um, subject rated effects. So in other words, how strong the participants said every uh, two minutes the effects were. On the y-axis, you have the scale running from zero to ten, and we had some descriptive anchors for that. Zero, if you got no effect, that's pretty easy. We had two different levels of um, possible mild effect, and that's sort of that level where someone says, yeah, maybe I feel something, but maybe not, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, 
think maybe I'll, I'll feel it in a minute. So that, that would be that one or two, two different levels of that. And then three to 10 are various um, ratings for strength of definite effect. So I definitely feel something, but it's not very strong. That would be a three. Going all the way up to 10, which we define as as strong as, an, as imaginable for this drug. And you have on the x-axis time with the administration, um, which is the inhalation time, uh, right here. We, I should say, take pre uh, an assessment of everything before the drug is administered. So that's just a couple minutes prior to the um, inhalation. And then the really cool thing here is that uh, you can see a, a very orderly dose-related and time-related um, relationship. So in fact, in this graph, just so it wasn't so busy, we're showing every other dose that we administered because there were so many. But across time, you see as there's all of the doses have a nice time-related effect with the peak effects um, immediately in the first measured time point after um, inhalation. And you see a nice um, dose effect where if you can decode the colors and work your way up, pretty, pretty uh, convincing um, demonstration that you know the stronger doses got uh, for stronger doses people report stronger effects. And a lot of folks would say, well, you could never really, you can't really control dose or anything with something like smoking or vaporization. But I think the proof is in the pudding. If you try to control your parameters and do your best job. You can come up with some solid data. So these are um, data not showing the time course, but the um, peak rating throughout the time course for everybody, and then we're averaging across participants. So what we're seeing on the x-axis here is different doses. This isn't time, but different doses of salvinorin A. And on the y-axis, we're showing at the top peak drug strength rated by the um, participant and the monitor. And um, on the bottom, uh, distance from uh, usual uh, daily reality and unresponsiveness uh, by the monitor. And the filled circles um, indicate just st statistically that these were statistically differentiated from placebo responding, which is all the way over here on the left. And uh, so ba the basic story here is in all of these measures, you got a nice, you know, pretty orderly uh, dose-related uh, effect on these measures. And yeah, yeah. That's when the person just didn't respond. Uh, didn't they were, yeah. <laughs> we <laughs> and we actually, for these purposes, you counted those folks as as, as a ten when they couldn't uh, respond. And so it actually really is impressive that you get a ten. I mean, in administering most drugs of abuse in the laboratory, psychomotor stimulants, opioids, sedatives, you name it. Rarely do you get a participant saying. You know, marking at the top end of a subjective effect scale. I mean, this is really impressive. And these were, you know, as I said, hallucinogen experienced folks. I mean, they were definitely some psychonauts in this study, um, so to speak. The body starts, yeah. Um, some people did report it some that they felt like they wanted to go somewhere, but we, we kept them yeah, nice and safe. We encouraged them to sit still. Um, uh, he was saying that there's reports of people at higher doses wanting to move, and I'm saying some people did report um, some uh, tendency there. So moving on, uh, very quickly, no physiological um, effects were observed, no change in blood pressure or pulse. And no observable tremor. We looked at that because some uh, primate research had shown tremor at extremely high doses. Um, in terms of the pharmacokinetic session, not everyone made it onto, uh, into that for different reasons. Um, part six participants underwent the pharmacokinetic session. And this means they had an indwelling um, uh, intravenous uh, catheter. So we had, you know, we were pulling blood from them during um, salvinorin. So we wanted to actually see how they responded to high dose of salvinorin before we went on to do that again with a blood draw. Um, and the doses for that session were 18 micrograms per kilogram and 21 um, across different participants. And here I'm showing you group um, uh, average data. Um, on the uh, left axis, the participant rated um, drug effect, um, again here, and that's the solid uh, circles. And then on the uh, right y-axis, we have the 
the Salvinor and a plasma level in nanograms per milliliter. So you can see, uh, and those are the, the open squares. And so on the, on the X we have uh, pre-drug, pre and then we have all the, um, we have the time points after the drug, and we, we're showing uh, minutes post-administration. So you see a really nice correspondence between um, the uh, levels in the blood and, uh, and the self-reported drug strength. Uh, moreover, looking at an individual basis, if we run correlate, when we ran correlations uh, between drug strength and plasma levels for each um, individual participant, for, you can ignore this if you're not statistically inclined, but the Pearson's um, a correlation coefficient ranged from 0.85 to 0.99, and they were significant for all participants. And we ran these with uh, Spearman Row in case there were distribution issues, and it looked very similar. So very, very convincing that we got uh, a strong correlations uh, um, between uh, plasma levels and subjective effects. So the narratives, a um, little more interesting than, the 11, than an 11 point scale. So they indicated intense, highly unusual subjective effects characterized by spiritual content, references to directionality, a lot of something to the left, something to the right, very common, up, down, becoming objects, revisiting childhood memories, that was very common, uh, recurring experiences across sessions, that really surprised us, where they would pick up interactions with entities that they had encountered, and they would even plan sometimes to ask the entity something else next time, and they would. It, it was really striking. Um, and all in, as I said, contact with various entities, much like um, if you're familiar with reports of DMT experiences, or at least some DMT experiences. Um, so I'll just read you some quotes here. Um, this is a male participant at a moderately high dose. I envisioned the driveway of my childhood where I played every day. I was just grabbing my jacket for my, for my mom in the house. Uh, this is something that I experienced in my real life uncountable times. I was not actually seeing this. I wasn't even envisioning or imagining this scene. It was simply the feeling and thoughts that go along with this event. I just felt the same feeling as a child who was uh, doing this would feel. And he had that driveway, some driveway type of experience across multiple sessions. Uh, another female participant at the second to highest dose uh, uh, wrote, I was being, being taken higher and higher into another amazing realm which was occupied by a familiar, nurturing, perhaps female presence. When I arrived in the presence of this being, she made a gesture that seemed to convey the sheer absurdity of the study at hand, and the scientists themselves, for that matter. It was like a big cosmic joke that was so overwhelmingly funny that I found myself hysterically, almost uncontrollably laughing at this point. I could say she was hysterically, uncontrollably laughing, for sure. Another participant, a, a male at the second to highest dose, I came back to the same place as last uh, time, so another recurrence um, of experience. Thankfully, there is no membrane between me and the experience, which had been in previous sessions, he reports a membrane between him and the experience. The feeling of awesomeness of where I was going is so beyond anything on earth time. Imagine everything every person has ever done in all of history, add it all together, and it would look like a small scratch on a rock in comparison to this state of being. This is the realm of the gods. My life on earth was just a stepping stone. Childhood, this is the next level. The of course moment comes. It all becomes clear. My mind is attempting to translate this otherworldly event by reaching for a memory from my past that perfectly mimics, mimics the same dynamics, which I think is a really interesting idea. That might be what's going on. I am around five years old and at, the park, at, at a park with my parents, and we came to take a part in a baseball game. It was a fun game, not for serious sport, but mostly older people, adults, were playing, being a very ch shy child. When it was time for me to take a swing with a bat, it terrified me. Walking up and removing my coat exposes the t-shirt underneath. I am wearing a Superman shirt. Everyone screams with joy and excitement. I am welcome by all. Welcome to the game. Welcome to the next level. So conclusions from the study, um, Salvinor A can be safely administered to medically and psychologically healthy, well-prepared participants. Vaporized Salvinor A showed systematic dose and time-related, subject-rated effects. 
Plasma levels of salvinorin A were highly and significantly correlated to subjective drug strength throughout the session, and subjective effects were extremely intense and often spiritual in nature. And so I'd just like to acknowledge, uh, well, first of all, my, my co-authors I mentioned at the beginning, but also others uh, who played a, a role in the study, Mary Casamano, who did the um, psychiatric screenings, Annie Umbricht, who provided physician coverage, and several research assistants at our unit, Eric Richter, uh, Jana Bonesteel, Crystal Barnhauser, Jenna Cohen, and also uh, our research unit's nursing staff, uh, several members of the nursing staff who really did a, an awesome job in um, helping us in that blood collection during the session, which was uh, quite interesting. The, if you're interested in some of these results, we have uh, two publications so far. Um, which covered some of the results that you see. Um, you can feel free to email me. I'd be happy to send anybody a PDF. Um, we want to thank the National Institute on Drug Abuse for funding. Um, hopefully, we'll have a paper within well, several months, I'll say, on the actual pharmacokinetic uh, component of the data I showed you and some more. We probably have time for about one question. When you were on the uh, pipe smoking slide, you flipped it very quickly. I couldn't read that fast. Um, I, I just did a layman study. Uh, and the indigenous people say it's sacrilegious to burn the plant. Yes. And the preferred method is sublingually with the fresh leaves. Yeah, and I believe that they actually um, um, swallow it, but it's through experimentation. Okay, believe that it's actually buccal absorption. Says they don't swallow it. It's held sublingually. Uh, you can swallow it for nutritious purpose. Uh, but um, what, was it, what was in the pipe? Was it dried leaves? It was pure salvinorin A oh, so extracted from, from the plant. So it's from the plant, but it was isolated very and cleanly. That's a, like a dry white powder or something? Yeah, exactly. It was a slightly off-white um, powder. It's kind of a little bit sticky. So then powder. you uh, measured the dose by weighing how much powder was in the pipe. Uh, well, we put a we weighed a dose uh, uh, a weight of salvinorin A, introduced that into acetone because these doses are so difficult to weigh, made a, a, a solution at equilibrium, uh, and then inserted a, a known volume so that would have an exact dose into that pipe, let it evaporate, and this was extremely clean acetone that didn't leave residuals. And then we were left Acetone with the dose. sounds like something added to it that would uh, change the effect of it. So no, uh, there was no acetone in what people inhaled. What, what, There's what, no acetone. What, what was burned? Was it uh, burned or was it vaporized? It was vaporized. Um, so with this type of pipe, the flame is applied underneath. And so it's more like heating a frying pan where the egg is on top. It's not like uh, cannabis or tobacco smoking where the flame is typically pulled through the material. So it was, flame was applied to the bottom and it was, um, it and, evaporated. And do you know what temperature it vaporizes at? No, we didn't measure the, the temperatures. It has a very high, um, uh, it has a very high uh, melting point and presumed, I don't think it's in the scientific literature yet with the what the actual um, vaporization point is. I don't think that's been reported. And, and if I uh, managed to read any of this, uh, do you make any theories or opinions about uh, doing this research using the vaporized smoke as opposed to chewing fresh leaves? Well, I think that would be very interesting. Uh, it, it may be impossible. If it would, it's at least going to be extremely difficult to get that approved by the FDA, um, if not impossible. Um, some folks uh, certainly report that um, the buccal absorption, like with using tinctures in the mouth, provides a, an easier to work with experience. I think that would be very interesting. There was a, a, a group, John Mendelson's group, did publish a study about the same time as this with uh, a sublingual buccal administration um, paired. I'm using the, the pure compound, though, not the leaf. They actually found no psychoactive effects at all, unfortunately. So. Thank you very much.